Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio. So, hour two. That's hour one, the news hour. A TV paranormal host, private investigator, and researcher Jennifer Marshall will be here. We'll talk about an awful lot of stuff. Most of it weird. Uh, the Unexplained from Talk Radio, we are. Coming up next, we're going to speak with Jennifer Marshall. She is a TV host, former private investigator, paranormal expert. She's going to be on and in the midnight hour, reaching you internationally at The Unexplained. Uh, talkradio.co.uk. You can uh, listen live there or through any one of multifarious apps. One that I use a lot is uh, TuneIn, but there are loads of apps, uh, including our own, to hear the unexplained. If you're in a far-flung part of the world, of course, we're on DAB Plus Radio here in the United Kingdom. And it's nice to hear from you, if uh, if you've been in touch with the show recently. Getting a lot of feedback on the Facebook page, the official Facebook page of The Unexplained with Howard Hughes. We're going to be speaking with Jennifer Marshall this hour, ex-member of the U.S. military, paranormal TV host, and actress as well, um, here's a little flavor of some of the stuff that Jennifer does on TV. Right here. What in the heck is that? Sunday. Is there finally legitimate proof that Bigfoot is real? He has videos, he has photos. I'm sleeping outside. Right. Yes. You're sleeping out here? Mysteries Decoded. Season finale this Sunday at 9, 8 central on The CW. Jennifer Marshall, thank you for coming on The Unexplained. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I love that trail. I've always wanted one of those big American trails made for me. You know, Sunday night <laughs> across the United <laughs> Kingdom, there is only one. But sadly, I think I'm going to have to wait for that. You have had, um, it was one of my listeners who suggested I got you on here, and I'm glad they did. You've had an amazing life. Um, kind of your, um, we call it curriculum vitae here. You call it resume. Begins yes. with your service in the U.S. military, doesn't it? Yes, yes. So I joined the Navy when I was 17 years old. I served for five years and then I got out and I ended up in Hollywood hosting a television show after I got my PI license. So go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you went from the military then to Hollywood and you became a private investigator. I did. I took a few years off and went to college and got some education. But uh, yes, I headed out to Hollywood in 2011 and uh, started working in the business in 2013 and opened my PI firm in 2019 after working for another PI for about four years. So th the idea of being in Hollywood and doing the acting thing, we know it's a very uncertain way of making a living. If you go to you know, Beverly Hills and go into a restaurant there, chances are that somebody's going to serve you who's also an actor or actress. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. just um, a fact of the matter. So did you become a private investigator to get an income while you were trying to get roles? Well, no, actually, I had moved out to Los Angeles not to host a TV show or to be an actor, but to be a police officer. I ended up getting injured in the academy. I had a pretty bad neck injury, and you know, I didn't want to give that dream up. And I said, okay, I still, I wanted to be a major crimes detective, a sex crimes detective, and I didn't want to give that up. So I said, well, what can I do on the civilian side? And so I decided to become a private investigator. So it kind of happened at the same time. Both careers kind of morphed at the same time, but it's been beneficial, my investigation to my acting career and my acting to my investigation career. Right. So the, I suppose you have to be methodical to be a private investigator. I've only ever met and interviewed one, and it was a formidable woman in uh, in Liverpool uh, at the very <laughs> beginning of my of my career, and she was amazing. And we talked about the nature of cases that she got involved in, and some mm -hmm. of those were you know bread and butter divorce cases where she was having to gather evidence, and some of those things were to do with um, you know what we might call today intellectual property issues and things like that. It's a fascinating field to get into. But it's, it's not, um, you know, if you've been in the military, it's not the automatic thing you would enroll for. No, no, it's definitely not. But a lot of the skills that I learned in the military being, you know, very observational, being very organized, those things, attention to detail, it's very important as a private investigator. And I've known a lot of people who have come in, in and out of the career. And it's something where if you don't have an eye for detail, this is definitely not the job for you. <laughs> So how did 
this is the, the bit that's intriguing about you. How did the interest in paranormality that's become your TV work now, how did that dovetail with the private, uh, private detection? You know, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I was not a big paranormal person. I'm very much a skeptic. And so when I was approached to host this TV show, I came in and we did a pilot episode and I was with a ufologist named Ryan Sprague. And I was very, very much brought in to be, you know, the scully to his Mulder uh, to reference the X-Files. And so I came in and I ended up... You know, it was weird. I went in with a very particular set of ideas. And after we filmed the episode about, you know, the supposed UFO crash in Roswell in 1947, I it kind of just threw me for a loop because I said, well, maybe I don't know everything that I think I do know. So with each episode, it kind of delved more into the paranormal or UFOs, um, cryptozoology. It really kind of broadened my horizons. And I said, listen, if there's no way to disprove these things, who am I to say that it just doesn't exist? So on the show, I'm still very much the skeptic, but I'm more of a believer than I thought I would have been prior to filming. And what was it about, and we will talk about the specific you know, cases, the Bigfoot cases and the others that you've investigated when we talk about specific programs that you've done. But, you know, how, how what was the process of becoming more of a believer? We're not saying you're a total believer. You didn't say that. But, you know, what, what was that process? How did that happen? Well, I'll tell you, the second episode that we shot was in the Lizzie Borden house. So Lizzie Borden killed, uh, you know, she was suspected of, of, murdering her parents with a hatchet in the 1800s. So we went into this house that is now a bed and breakfast and it's a hot spot for paranormal investigators. And I really went in thinking, you know, the private investigation community is going to laugh me out of the business. I'm really, you know, putting time and effort toward this. I, I just was not a fan, but I went along with it because I said, you know, this is the CW genre and I, I want to do this and I want to kind of explore this. But there was a part of me that just thought this is complete nonsense. So we went in and we started filming and uh, there were some very, very, crazy things that happened that I could not explain that I tried for weeks to explain away and I couldn't. So I'm thankful that that episode was the second episode that we shot because then it kind of made me second guess my feelings on every other episode. Um, I'll give you a quick example. We were in the room and they said, Jennifer, lie down in the spot where Abby Borden was found. And I laid down on that spot exactly as she was. And these paranormal investigators came in and they said, listen, we see an apparition above you. And I was just thinking, can we be done with this already? I'm hungry. Can I have some Doritos or something? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I felt a, a prick of static electricity in my rib cage. Now, you know, that only happens if, you know, you're scuffing up static electricity with your feet, you touch something, or if someone or something touches you. So at that point, I said an expletive, I stood up and I said, we are done. I don't know what's going on here, but we're done. And they cut that out because clearly they're not going to put me saying expletives on network TV. Um, but it did it, it, it frightened me to some extent because I could not explain it. Right. And what do you, I mean, obviously, when you do these TV programs, they have various people who say that they're experts in the field who have various bits of equipment. What was the explanation that you were given for what you felt? Um, you know, it's still kind of the gear that the paranormal investigators use. It's clearly not scientifically proven, but scientists also can't look and say for a voice box, for instance, they can't really explain why it does what it does. What they tend to do is say, well, it's confirmation bias. You think it's saying this. And so, of course, you're going to believe that it's saying this. So I was open to, you know, the technology that they said they had. But also, my co-host on that episode was a medium. And I was not happy about being paired with a medium, you know, still very much a skeptic. And we went in and there were things that she saw and things that she said that I did not give her any sort of reason for thinking that or saying that. There was several times when I felt this presence come back, which she later said was uh, the ghost of a child. And when I would feel this presence come back, I didn't show it, I didn't look around, you know, I didn't change facial expressions. And she would say to me, the child's back, do you feel her? Do you see her? Do you sense her? And this happened numerous times with the camera on and with the camera off. So after the second time, it happened four times, I said, well, maybe she is seeing something that I'm not because I feel it, but I certainly can't see it on a visual plane. Mm. 
And when I've never done, you know, a television program like that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually just the guy who's the voice, you know, the disembodied voice in the background. So I'm fascinated by the way these programs are compiled. And looking through your, some of your stuff, and certainly something that I saw on television here in the UK last night uh, was a, a whole episode of one of the, the big series um, about a thing called the Dibbuk Box. Have you heard of that? I have not. What is it called? Okay. It's, I think it's D-Y-double-B-U-K, Dibbuk. Uh, it, is a, it is a box... Uh, with doors on it, uh, and I think there may be a number of these, but they are said to contain, for want of a better word, evil. Okay, so you open the doors on the box and you don't know what you're letting out of it. It's literally a kind of Pandora's box kind of thing. So it's a locked thing. And on this particular episode, there was a master Dibbuk box, but there were also the evil that had been contained therein. Uh, had been decanted apparently into 10 smaller boxes that had then been shipped out to various places. And the people on this TV show had got one of the boxes, uh, you know, back there and they opened this thing. And then we were invited under various investigative conditions like an EMF electromagnetic meter, um, you know, the, uh, a temperature, uh, thermal camera, you know, temperature sensitive camera and also various forms of subdued lighting. We were then invited to watch what happened when all of this was unleashed. So the point I'm getting to here, and you can answer this question, Jennifer, is when you're doing a show like that, to get the results that you need to keep an audience interested, how much do you have to record to get, say, an hour or half an hour of television? Oh, a lot, a lot. We film, I would say, probably seven days, six to seven days of, you know, 12 at least 12 hour days. And, you know, on my show, I don't allow anything to be faked. Not that the network would, you know, appreciate that or the production company would go along with that. But I, I told them up front, I understand about ratings, but I don't fake things and I'm not okay with that. So, um, you know, it's six to seven days and then they end up cherry picking, of course, what what is shown. But there's also so much that is shown, that so much that is filmed that we can't show due to time constraints. So I hope that this year the CW will release some of those scenes kind of as an added bonus because it is really, really interesting stuff that ends up not getting into that 41 minutes and 15 seconds that were allotted. <laughs> 41 minutes 15 seconds which is a, com <laughs> a commercial hour as we call it both sides of the atlantic um, have you yeah. ever had to do anything like a lot of these shows they they put somebody like yourself who is not you know a fully qualified whatever that is paranormal investigator but somebody who's learning about it all they put you in a situation where they say okay here's a haunted location you said you went to the lizzie borden house for one um you're going to stay the night here have you ever been put in that situation where you've been put in a really spooky place and they've said, right, you're doing the night there, you're sleeping here? Yes, I was put in that position for Lizzie Borden and I have mm. not slept in a house since then because I told them, um, you know, I very much deal with things that I can see and things that I can prove and things that I can understand and it is a little bit frightening when I don't understand the things that are happening on the paranormal side. So the medium was very happy to stay the night. I was not very happy to stay the night and we actually filmed an episode. I cannot say what it's what it's on, but we filmed an episode for season 2 and they said, "Do you want to stay in this place?" and I said, "Absolutely not. I'm not I'm not going to do that and it doesn't really lend anything to the show and I'm not comfortable doing it. So thankfully, uh, they they were okay with that, but um, it, it can be very, very scary. And with the Lizzie Borden incident, the little small child that was following me around continued to follow me around for months after the program shot. Well, so you mean I, you, you took I, the little child home? I believe that I did, sadly, because... Um, you know, I was saged after, and they explained to this this small child um, that Jennifer has children. You can't be around her children. You need to stay here. She'll come back and play. They did this whole sort of ceremony thing. And then there were several times over the next few months where I felt that presence come back. I never saw anything, thankfully, but I felt the presence come back. It was this overwhelming feeling of, 
affection and a need to protect whatever this presence was. And the medium had said this child was uh, murdered either intentionally or through neglect by her mother. And the reason that she's drawn to you is because of your mama bear energy. I have four kids. I'm very protective of them. Um, but still, I, I that was uncomfortable for me. Every time the child would come back, it was a good feeling, but it was sort of kind of an unsettling feeling um, because, uh, you know, I can't explain it and I don't know why the child has not returned to where she was. You, you used a, a phrase there, I didn't pick you up on it at the time, saged. What is that? So saging is when they come in and they burn sage. I think it's to get rid of the oh, negative Oh, I understand. Energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they, they tried to clear anything that might have adhered to you. Yes, and the medium did it, and also the paranormal investigators did it. And the first time that I felt the child come back, I said, well, that, you know, that's probably just my imagination. But it's not something that I wanted to happen. It's not something that I thought would happen. So the first time I dismissed it. But after that, the second, the third, the fourth time, I can't dismiss that anymore because it happened out of nowhere. It wasn't like I was thinking about it. We were actually outside of the gates of Area 51, which is a notorious military base with secretive things in the United States. We were outside of Area 51, and that was the last time that the, the child presence came. She was sitting on my lap in the Jeep, and I thought, this is just so bizarre. And if you would have told me a year ago this would have happened, I would have said, you're crazy. This is ridiculous. No, no. Um, so there's these things. And when I you say she I was sitting on on your lap, I mean this is fascinating. Sorry to interrupt. Could, no, I mean, could you could you feel her? Were you just kind of aware of something? How were you aware of her presence? So when she came to me in the Lizzie Borden house, and then after, it was you know you would think that you would be scared because you're in a house that's supposedly haunted. I was not scared when this child came. I felt this overwhelming feeling of happiness with a mist of affection, a hint of affection, and the need to protect whatever it was. I couldn't explain it because if you're around a ghost, you would think you would feel scared or you would feel mm -hmm. nothing. You wouldn't feel the, the weird thing that I felt. So in Area 51, the last time that, I, that she was there, I felt kind of it come back, the happiness, the affection, and then I did feel similar to what I felt in the Lizzie Borden house when she was sitting on my lap. Um, it just feels like there's a slight, slight weight. And I, I can't explain it. It's not as much as a cat. It's, you know, not five to eight pounds or something. But it's just enough where you notice something, but you can't really figure out what it is. And I don't think I would have noticed if I didn't also feel the feelings I felt when she came back. And I expected that she would continue to come back, but she never did. That was the last time. And did you try, I'm asking you this for a reason, I was once in a, I spent most of my life in a radio studio, but I was once in a radio studio that I was convinced was haunted. And I was mm -hmm. convinced that uh, the personality of somebody very famous who'd worked in that studio was somehow there. I just got this feeling. But I asked mm -hmm. him, and his name was Kenny Everett, a great broadcaster, and I was working in a studio that Kenny Everett had worked in. And there was a microphone suspended from the ceiling. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that I'm wondering whether you did anything like this. I had the feeling that maybe there was a presence there, and I was trying to dismiss it. I thought, no, come on, Howard, this is ridiculous. But in a completely airless environment, the suspended microphone, if I said, if you're there, can you move this microphone, which was suspended by four sort of guy wires from the, from the ceiling of the studio, so you could move it in any plane or direction. And when I said that, this microphone that never moved started to swing backwards and forwards. So I asked what I felt was a presence that was somehow around me to do something. So <laughs> the reason for telling you that story is, did you try with the presence of this little girl to get her to do something to make her presence with you more definitive? With her, I did not because I, first of all, I didn't know her age and I didn't know if she would quite be able to understand. There were some things that the medium asked her to do that she kind of was um, not clear on. So I don't, I, I wasn't able to ascertain kind of her, her mental age or physical age. So I didn't. And I think a part of me also, um, I kind of felt like I didn't need to because it was a very, because it had happened so many times and then the medium had said, do you, do you see her? She's back. Do you feel her? She's back. So by that point, 
her existence had been confirmed after I felt it by a third party several times. So I didn't really feel the need to do that because I knew when she came back. But for season two, we filmed in a place that is notoriously haunted. And there was a time when I said something to the extent of, okay, you were playing games with me earlier. If you're there, come out. Come out and stop playing games. And the people who run the house had said you have to be very careful about that with antagonizing spirits and i said well you know if the cameras are on let's Mm -hmm. let's get to it let's let's move this along um and so we we were we were high we were highly advised not to do that because it could be considered provoking but there were several things that we caught on camera again in this episode um that i can't explain and did you never feel in all of these things to do with ghosts, that you might be, because you knew the story, obviously because you, you were there to investigate it, you you would know the details of the story. Did you ever feel that you were maybe deluding yourself? You, do, you don't sound like the kind of person who would succumb to that, but did you ever have that quite human feeling? No, I really didn't because I went in thinking this is BS, to be candid with you. I thought, this is BS, this is nonsense, they're running this bed and breakfast to, you know, get money from people to exploit a tragedy, and they're quite nice people, but that was my impression going in. And so when things would happen, I would try everything in my power to talk myself out of it and say, okay, well, what are some other things that could have happened? And I always had a list of maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, Um and there, there were just some things that I, I could not explain. Now, is it possible? I'm certainly open to, is it possible that because of the environment, I could have seen things maybe not as they were? Yes, of course. Human beings, you know, memory is fallible and you never know. Um, but especially with what we shot in season two, uh, again, things happened that that there's no explanation for at all. And there's one episode that I know is going to be really really just astounding for the audience that i can't wait for them to see because it's it's even more explosive than what happened at the lizzie borden house what's really impressive is that you go into these things it sounds to me like i would go into these things you know i tend to go into most of the things that i look at or investigate or do shows about thinking i don't think i believe that (laughs) i really don't Mm -hmm. and if you go into (laughs) if you go into things with that kind of mindset i think you learn you know, sometimes you learn that actually you were right and the, the so-called phenomenon that you might be looking at is, is really nothing to report, nothing to write home about. But sometimes you're going to have, uh, we have a phrase over here, gobsmacked. You're going to be gobsmacked. You're going to be amazed. And that sounds to me like that's the mindset, which I think, Jennifer, is a very healthy mindset to, to have for all of this. You went to Area 51. Now, we all know mm-hmm. that Area 51 is this place where it is claimed that alien technology is being back-engineered. Some people claim that aliens live there. We know that uh, whatever is done there, whatever military work is done there, it's highly secret. You can't go through the gates. In fact, if you do try to go through the gates, there's a sign there saying, we're going to shoot you effectively. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, it's a place that there's a lot of folklore about. There's even an airline, which you will know, that flies workers in. they are planes that don't have markings on them. People get mm-hmm. flown into Area 51. But... Some people have claimed they know what goes on at Area 51. You know, one or two have claimed they worked there. It's a place of deep mystery. But I wonder what, as part of your TV series, going to Area 51 could have achieved, because all you can do is stand at the gates or close to them. Mm -hmm. We we had the opportunity to talk to a man who, Bob Lazar, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Uh, We had the opportunity to talk to Jeremy Corbell, who did a documentary on Bob Lazar. Yes, I know Jeremy, yeah. Yeah, so we we had the chance to talk to him. We had a chance to talk to people who are familiar with the sort of technology utilized at Area 51. And, of course, we couldn't go in, but there's enough with satellite images. There's enough with uh, eyewitness accounts. There's enough with logs that you can kind of just do as much as you can about this particular location. Area 51 was a very sticky episode because... I knew certain things serving in the military. I didn't know if those things had been declassified. And honestly, it's not my position as a veteran of the U.S. military to give away anything that I'm not absolutely sure has been declassified. So I had to be very careful. So did you go, sorry to interrupt again, did you go into Mm -hmm. it with the belief that some of these things that have been claimed about Area 51's purpose may be correct? 
Yes, def- I, I definitely thought that. I think what the public is misinformed about is, you know, after Area 51 kind of blew up in the media and people knew about it, a lot of the technology was moved to other bases. So um, it's, you know, I'm not saying that there's not technology at Area 51 because clearly there is, um, but things were moved. So did I believe that they were reverse engineering Mm-hmm. aircraft there i mean it's it's absolutely possible look at how technology has exponentially grown within the last 75 years if we are not reverse engineering something extraterrestrial or extraterrestrial in nature then how do you explain how that technology you know has has boomed in the last 75 years more well, than it I, has I totally, the entire time totally get what you're saying I mean, there are people who will say yeah. how is it that we went from developing the model t ford or the Wright Brothers first shaky little, you know, biplane. How did we get mm-hmm. to that? To the silicone transistor in just a few decades? It's it's astonishing. Right. And there are people who say, well, maybe we had a little helping hand along the way. Um, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't ask you to, to break any confidentiality or anything that you'd signed. We have the Official Secrets Act here in the UK, so I understand that. Um, mm-hmm. But clearly, your interest was piqued by Area 51. And, you know, I'll ask you this. Do you have reason to think that they may be somehow involved with aliens there? I don't know if aliens per se. I would say that if you you asked me a yes or no, do you think it's more likely that there was a craft that we are in possession of that we are reverse engineering? I would say more than likely, yes. If you Mm. look at the number of planets and you look at at the statistical improbability that we are alone in this universe, you know, people who think that we are alone, that's, that's just not possible the numbers don't reinforce that thought so i do believe that it's it's possible and probably it's probable that there has been at least one crashed craft of some sort whether or not they're reverse engineering it or they're just learning from it they're taking things from it i don't know what the extent there is but i would say Mm -hmm. most likely yes Okay, no, I would uh, I would tend to agree with you, uh, based on a lot of interviews that I've done. Uh, you met Bob Lazar. I've been trying to. I'm very jealous. I've been trying to get Bob Lazar through Jeremy Corbell on my show for years now, and so far have not succeeded. Bob Lazar, just to remind my listener, is somebody who says that he worked at Area 51, and I think he said that, um, for example, his his working records had been somehow disappeared, so it's hard for him to stand that story up. But he's got a lot of tales to tell about Area 51 and what he says goes on there. What did you make of him? So I want to clarify, we did not meet Bob, we met Jeremy, but I have seen so many, because I was working on this case for months, I have seen all of Bob's videos, I have seen things that were not in the documentary, I've, you know, I've done so much research on Bob, it's almost like if I had seen Bob, I would say, oh, I've, I've, I've met Bob before, because it was all things Bob for months on end. So um, when we were talking to Jeremy, and there were certain things that were said off camera that I, that I can't go into, uh, but there were explanations where I said, well, what about this? What is Bob's reasoning for this? What is Bob's reasoning for this? What is Bob's reasoning for this? A lot of it made sense. And I was the first person who wanted to go in and discredit Bob Lazar. I wanted to discredit him. I I did not believe what he was saying at face value. But the more that I looked into it, I said, okay, there, there has to be something more here. There has to be something more. He doesn't have anything to gain. He was just on Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm. He wouldn't even accept a plane ticket out there. He has not benefited at all. If anything, it's really been detrimental to his but life, to his personal life. Isn't it life. interesting that, that so many people would you know, be very, very keen to talk with him? I've been trying, like I say, for mm-hmm. three or four years to get him on my shows online or on the radio, and you know, I can't do it. I haven't been able to get him. You weren't able mm-hmm. to get him. In, if the right. story was so so credible, if it was such a big story that we need to know, wouldn't you think he would make more appearances? No, I I actually believe that he would continue to do what he's doing because he has put the information out there and he said, if you believe me, that's great. Um, If you don't, that's great. I just ask that you do your own research, never take anything at face value. So I actually think that by him not capitalizing on this, that only reinforces his story more. And there's still certain things that they, they can't explain. They said, well, Bob Lazar doesn't have this educational background. Well, then why was he hired at the places he was hired mm. at? They tried to say he was not hired in New Mexico. And then Very later, 
Mm-hmm. And then later it turned out because there was a white pages sort of document at, 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 on the base, someone found that and Bob Lazar's name was in there. So you can't tell me, well, this person was hired, you know, in some, some role that requires a secret security clearance, top secret security clearance. And then, oh no, that person never worked here. Well, there's documents that show that they did, that they did work there. And uh, it always, it always, it never fails to amaze me when people say, well, the government is not going to try to cover that up. The government absolutely tries to cover a lot of things up. The government, when people say conspiracy theories, you need to look at each one and judge it on its own merits because they don't pop up out of nowhere generally. There's some kernel of truth in almost every single one. Well, you get uh, a large degree of of agreement from me. You know about the meaning of commercials and commercial breaks, so hold that thought, Jennifer Marshall, American paranormal TV host, and so much more as we've been hearing. She's back, and I'm back very soon here on the Unexplained at Talk Radio. Stay here. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. This hour, we're talking with Jennifer Marshall in the United States. Very impressive individual, military background, private investigator, paranormal TV host, with a very balanced view, don't you think, of all of this uh, this material, which is what you have to have, I think, to look into these things. You can't go into them saying, gee whiz, isn't that amazing, and it's bound to be all true, because some of it probably isn't. So, Jennifer, there are so many cases that you've worked on. I'm talking paranormally here. Um, you, you've checked out the Bermuda Triangle. I'm not quite sure how you can do that, but tell me. (laughs) Well, when they brought it up as a possible episode, I said, well, how on earth are we going to do that without actually going into the Bermuda Triangle and, you know, doing something potentially dangerous? But we, it was a great episode. We went to, there's a naval base in Bethesda where we went, we spoke to physicists, we learned about magnetite on the ocean floor. Um, We talked to another physicist about bubble theory, whether or not bubbles could be coming to the surface and dragging these ships down. We talked to a pilot who supposedly had gone into some sort of time warp, as he explained it. While over the Bermuda Triangle, we looked at statistics. There was a lot of things that we did, and we actually went down to Miami and interviewed a lot of people there. So it was a very intriguing episode. A lot of people try to debunk the Bermuda Triangle, but the most interesting thing, and the thing that I've never had the chance to do, is to talk to somebody that you had the chance to talk to, somebody who'd actually experienced one of these phenomena. You know, what was it like to speak to a pilot? And there have been many over the years who say that, you know, he or she lost time as a result of the Bermuda Triangle effect. You know, it was interesting. I am, I, people who know me and people who know my investigative style will say that I loathe eyewitness accounts. And I absolutely do because memory is like Swiss cheese and things get, you know, Mm. into the holes and you kind of think that this is what you saw or this is what you remember and you really don't. And to be fair, all the pilot had to offer us was a gas receipt and it had been many decades since then. So I have no doubt in my mind that he believed what had happened to him had happened. I wasn't questioning his honesty, but you just don't, there's no way to ascertain what really happened, especially when it was that long ago. So it was interesting. It certainly added a dimension to our investigation, but I do take eyewitness accounts with a grain of salt. I'm very science focused. I'm very facts focused. And that was kind of, uh, although it was intriguing, it's not something that furthered the investigation. Right. And how did you come out of it? Do you believe that there is something going on there that may be natural in origin and very unusual and perhaps specific to this one place on the planet? Or do you, are you inclined to think maybe a lot of this has been overblown over the years? A little bit of a mix. I do think that it's a clever manipulation of the statistics that exist. I think that there is a slightly higher level of ships and planes going missing in that area, but nothing like pop culture has allowed us to believe, has led us to believe. But I also think that there is some sort of phenomenon that we don't quite understand, which is adding to the number of ships and planes going missing in this area. And I I would have to say that 
in this specific circumstance, I would assume that it's environmental in nature rather than paranormal. There is a theory about rogue waves and what causes mm. rogue waves, and physicists actually hate that theory because they said, well, there's no such thing as a rogue wave. There's a reason why these huge waves are created. We just have to find the reason. So I do think that in that particular area, that could be accounting for some of the missing ships. But even that is fascinating. If there's a natural process that can generate a wave so colossal that it can overwhelm a craft and cause it to be pulled or sucked down and completely disappear. I mean, that, that's something, it may not be paranormal, but we don't understand it. Oh, absolutely. And when we went up to this Navy base in Bethesda, um, everyone there has a clearance. There's only actually one Navy person. It's mainly all civilians who are physicists and people with doctorates. And we went in and it's the Navy's indoor ocean. So they actually had, you know, wow. this huge water basin set up and they had model ships inside and they could make it, you know, a, a typhoon, a level five, or they could make it a sunny, breezy day in Tahiti. So it was really interesting seeing how the different water could water conditions could affect these ships. You could see it in real time. Right. Now, next hour on my show, uh, I speak to a man called David Taylor. He's a researcher into a thing or phenomenon they, they have in Australia called the Yowie, which, if you believe in the Yowie, is apparently a close cousin to Bigfoot, which is what you have in the United States, a large, hairy, shambling of gait, bipedal creature that people sometimes claim has a paranormal origin because they feel strange things, even telepathy around it. Certainly, it's elusive because, you know, we don't find bodies, we don't find encampments. All we have are, are frequent sightings. Now, you, in an episode of your show, Mysteries Decoded, you did an episode, I think it was entitled, Is Bigfoot Real? Yes. <laughs> if, if, if that was the right title, what are your thoughts on that proposition? You know, Bigfoot is an interesting sort of phenomenon. There was someone that we went to talk to, and I won't give him any more press because I feel like what he said was um, kind of just malarkey. But we did go and talk to him, and he was talking about how he had these encounters with Bigfoot. And I was more focused on, all right, again, I don't want to see these eyewitness accounts because people can lie for fame, fortune. They can be mistaken. I really wanted to look at the science. So I kind of discounted what this particular person had to say because he had financial gain that uh, could come from claiming that he saw Bigfoot. So we looked at the science of it and we went to Idaho and we spoke to uh, Dr. Meldrum who works with, he's an anthropologist and he, mm. you know, has been looking into Bigfoot for years, Bigfoot, um, Yeti, what they call in China, the Yaren. And so he actually has footprints he has hair samples that they they can't ascertain where this hair came from so do i think that bigfoot is this widespread thing i don't but there is quite a possibility that there is a missing link out there in very small numbers we don't know about and someday it may come to light they may classify it as you know whatever they classify it as scientifically but that in fact would be what people are seeing the yaoi the yaren the bigfoot the yeti i do believe that that is quite possible because because especially in the United States, if you go into the northern United States, you go into parts of Canada, that is very, very dense, mountainous terrain, and a lot of it is untouched by humans. So how can we really ascertain what's there and what's not? It's a very difficult proposition. And there's an amazing video that I think was shot in Alaska, certainly somewhere way up north, cold and snowy. Um, and this has appeared within the last year or so. You might even have seen this one where a couple of guys are on a ridge and they're looking down into a valley that is snow packed, snow covered. There's nothing there mm -hmm. because it's a very hostile territory. So the, theoretically, the only human beings there are these two guys shooting this video. And down in the valley, you can see quite clearly, even though it's off at a distance, is a large, hairy, bipedal, shambling creature but making its way through the snow with a deftness that you and i couldn't manage unless we had mechanical assistance really moving fast through the snow what do you make of you know videos and pictures and even the famous uh, 1960s film that purported to be of a bigfoot you know those claim to be evidence but of course it is very easy i'm not saying that those people that i referred to did but it would be fairly easy to fake such things these days 
Right. I don't think I'm familiar with the specific video you're talking about, and I will have to look that up because it sounds intriguing. As far as the you know, the videos that we've seen, there were a couple of videos that uh, the subject in Canada took where one was, um, you know, like a face. There were actually two different faces, and we were trying to figure out, are these videos legitimate? And we took them to a forensic expert, and she said, well, these videos have not been altered. Um, what was shot was actually what was shot. So we took these videos to a renowned Hollywood um, he's a guy who works in Hollywood, his name's Kenneth Hall, and he makes masks and he makes costumes for Hollywood and he has 40 years of experience. And he's, he looked at these and he said, these are, this is a mask and this is basically a stuffed animal on a stick. Okay. So he was able to tell us that these two videos were, <laughs> they were, they weren't faked on a technological level, they were absolutely fake on, on, on a different level. Um, and then as far as the Patterson Gimlin film, that is the one thing I keep coming back to because it's very difficult. You can't say, well, it's, it's definitely a fake because if you look at the way the hair moves, um, it's, there's kind of no explanation for whatever it was that they captured yeah. in this film. So I would that be film, very I think, surprised. was made in 1967, and they've analyzed that yes. so many times. And there mm -hmm. are, every time they analyze it, there are more questions that come out of it than answers. <laughs> Absolutely. And, we, you know, we've broken <laughs> it down frame by frame. So I think that that is still kind of, uh, it has not been debunked, and it's still kind of out there as a, maybe this was something. Now, it's really bad to ask you this with only a minute or so to go, but you did investigate for part of Mysteries Decoded vampires. And every so often, yes. stories of vampirism get into the papers here. So, you know, I, I don't know whether you can answer this in 45 seconds, but from your investigations, do vampires exist? I would say no, but the lore of the idea, um, people love it, especially when we went to New Orleans, it sustains tourism culture there. So is the idea of a vampire alive in, you know, a, a, a sense that's not necessarily physical? Absolutely, it's in people's minds, it's in their hearts. But is there such thing as an immortal vampire roaming the streets? No. <laughs> Oh, well, some people may be disappointed. Uh, some people may be relieved. What are you, uh, just quickly, what are you working on at the moment? So we are shooting season two of Mysteries Decoded. We've been put on pause because of Corona. We want to make sure that everybody is is safe during during these COVID-19 times. And I recently shot a film that should be airing in the summer. And I just booked another film that I'm shooting this month. So it's been busy. Right. It sounds it. Uh, it's been a delight to speak with you, Jennifer. I think you've got a terrific approach to it all. And, you know, more, as we say in the UK, more power to your elbow, which basically means best of luck with all of your work. Um, where do people see Mysteries Decoded in the UK? So I don't know if it's available in the UK, but if you have a VPN, you can certainly get around this. I <laughs> always utilize my VPN. It's at www.cwseed, S-E-E-D, like a seed you plant, .com. All of the episodes are available to stream for free. Jennifer, thank you very much for your time. Jennifer Marshall there. Look out for her. Mysteries Decoded is the series. Next hour after midnight. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio.